afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the United States. This is George Hicks, the National Broadcasting Company. This is the World Series of 1937. We're speaking from our box directly behind home plate on the lip of the third tier at Yankee Stadium in New York City. But you fans don't need to have me tell you what this is all about. It's the New York Yankees World Champions of 1936. Again, tennis winners this year in the American League versus the New York Giants, National League champions of 1937, and for the World Championship in baseball. And this is the fifth World Series since the beginning in 1905 between the two New York teams. Well, we've been in our chairs here since 11 a.m. this morning, now 1.15. The bleachers sending in an irregular curve from middle left field around to middle right were packed solid on our arrival this morning. And the third tier of moderate price reserve seats were also packed at that time, except the extreme tips at left and right field, and now they're filling up. The expensive boxes and first layer tier are now filled practically, except for the last moment arrivals. There must easily be 50,000 or a little more here now before game starts, and they're still pouring in. NBC has its baseball experts manning the microphones. Tom Manning, NBC sports announcer from Cleveland, one of the best. Well, he'll describe the first half of the game. Beside him is Red Barber, star sports announcer from station WLW in Cincinnati. Both, uh, by the way, are red-headed. So remember, when the action gets hot, these two red-headed flashes will be throwing the words at you. And with them is Warren Brown, the friendly and wise ball expert, sports editor of the Chicago Herald Examiner. He'll give you the expert opinions, the inside facts that only he knows. Now, so much for what's to come. Right now, the Yanks are just potting in off the diamond. The caretakers are out with their rakes and the chalk lines, the manicuring, which goes on just before the game starts. It's just about ten minutes now. The photographers are flashing balls at the, at the first row box seat where all the celebrities are seated. It's so muggy today, incidentally, that they're using flash balls. The Giants are now coming into their dugout. The weather is humid. Uh, whether this is October 6th or not, uh, perspiration is running off our faces, and the bleachers are in shirt sleeves, making that white background. Uh, it rained last night here in New York. But now the sky is a pale blue with those low, steamy clouds breaking and floating right over our heads and the pennants up on top of the horseshoe. But boy, it's thick and it's hot out here, but I, I'm sure it won't rain. Mayor LaGuardia is here, oh, Mickey Cochran, the old, the old bike of Detroit, looking fit again, and the babe, Genio, he was wiping his face a moment ago in a blue serge suit. Sits in a box right down below us beside the Yankee dugout with him is Mrs. Ruth and his daughter, uh, Jacob Rupert. Genial, handsome, smiling with Mayor LaGuardia. Uh, Mr. Rupert stood and shook hands with the babe while the photographers took their pictures. Cheers and excitement. The comments running like fire through the stands uh, have been uh, egging us on since noon when the audience follows DiMaggio, Gary, Dickey, Selkirk, Moore, and Ott. All the sluggers as they drop their long drives into either left or right field stand. Uh, the Giants today are the visitors. Uh, they're in gray with bright azure blue caps, uh, blue shirt sleeves and socks. The Yanks in white with uh, dark blue caps and socks. The crowd got a, got a terrific howl a few moments ago when Gomez put a long punch into the right field stand. Uh, at batting practice uh, about 12.30 when the Giants came in, Hubble got a fine hand when he came to bat, but the best he could do was to ground to the infield. The crowd uh, also cheered young Jack McCarthy, first baseman of the Giants, when he put several long drives into right field stand. And uh, they said, well, uh, uh, look at who we got here, as much as to say, well, this boy is right up there with Garrick and the Uh A quarter of a mile away on the top of the apartment roof, which uh, are jagged in modernistic style, are the, the apartment roof galleryites uh, who pay no tickets and who get a very much of a bird's eye view of the entire scene. The club is now down behind home plate on the giant side. 
Warming up, taking his time. Wipes his head with his shirt sleeve. Puts his old left arm across. And there's the ball. Gomez is doing the same thing on the Yankee side. The photographers are squatted around them. And the caretakers are now laying out their chalk marks around home plate and the batter's boxes. The band is playing in center field. Pause for a moment for the mouth speaker announcement, which said for the people in the aisles to please take their seats. It's just minutes now before the beginning of history in baseball for 1937. The green stands are packed, red, white, and blue bunting on all sides, excitement growing, and now that's the general theme. Let's get down to what this really means. Beside me is Warren Brown that I spoke to you about. Warren, come on and give us the facts about 1937. All right, George, this is really the most exciting series, or I anticipate that it will be the most exciting series of the sort of a traditional rivalry that has grown up between the New York Giants and the New York Yankees. As you have been told, or perhaps know already, this is the fifth meeting between these two clubs. They met for the first time in 1921. And baseball history of sorts has been made since then. In 1921, for example, there was no Yankee Stadium. Both of the New York clubs played in the Polar Grounds, which is across the Harlem River. In the 1921 series, the New York Giants were tops in baseball. John McGraw was leading them, and they were a fiery baseball club. In my judgment, the club that Bill Terry is sending out on the field this afternoon is the best New York club since the heyday of McGraw. In that 1921 series, the uh, games were played on the basis of five out of nine rather than the four out of seven, which had existed in earlier years and which has been brought back into play now. In that 1921 series, the Giants won five and the Yankees won three. The following year, 1922, the Giants won again, and they won four games. The Yankees didn't win any. That was the return to the four out of seven, as far as the Giants and Yankees were concerned. The Yankees started to get going in 1923, which was the third successive year that Yankees and Giants played in the World Series. And the thought strikes me now, as I've looked at these two pennant races in the National and American League, that maybe we're back to those old days again. The Giants and Yankees won last year. And they won again this year, having proven conclusively in their respective leagues that they were far and away the best ball clubs in those leagues. So it is quite possible that we may have another stretch of three years, or possibly more, of these all-New York series, the Subway series, as they call them. In 1923, when the Yankees won the World Championship from the Giants, they won four, and the Giants won two. After that, the Yankees fell apart a little bit, and it took them a little while to rebuild until they came back stronger than ever. The Giants won another pennant in 1924, but they didn't have the Yankees as their opponents in the World Series that year. Thus it was we came into 1936 before the two clubs met again. And, of course, we will all remember that the Yankees won a really sensational series here last year, four games out of six. Summing up then, we find that down through these four series that have been played to date, the Giants have won 13 games, and the Yankees have won 11, which seems to me to bring the two teams very close. In a sense, then, this series, which begins today, being the fifth, is a rubber series. Unless, of course, we figure that they're going to keep right on going again next year. These meetings between the Giants and the Yankees have been productive of some sensational baseball, some very colorful things. Some of the strangest things that have ever happened in World Series play have happened when the Giants were meeting the Yankees. It was in one of these series that we had the famous episode in which a plate umpire declared that it was dark when very few people in the park thought it was dark, with the result that the Commissioner Landis, who, to whom the uh, decision of the umpire came as much of a stunning surprise as to anybody else, decided to give the money that was spent for those tickets to charity. That was one of the more famous incidents of this giant Yankee series. There were a lot of uh, strange plays and a lot of sensational plays. But that's almost enough for the past. Let us get to the present. Looking at the lineups today, which the loudspeaking system is about to give you, perhaps I should pause and let you hear that.
pitchers and the catchers and the umpires. Gomez versus Hubble, which we've been expecting this meeting between the two representative left-handers of their respective leagues. As I look through the batting orders and the lineups of the two teams, I find one thing that must be of interest to far off California. I notice that the New York Yankees in their starting lineup have no less than five out of their nine ball players coming from California. Ladies and gentlemen, the national anthem.
Derrick on the system. One man down in the first inning of this first game of the World Series. And little Dick Bartell. Right hand hitter. Short stop of the Giants is next. He's a little fellow, but he can hit that ball to the far corner. Dick is 29 years old. This year he batted 306. Lefty Gomez. The pitch. The foul back against the speed. Matt Ormsby, the American League umpire, tosses out a new ball to Bill Dickey. You know, Bill Dickey is one of the tallest catchers ever to come into the major league. And what a catcher. The first inning, one man out. Nobody on. Lefty Gomez. Ball, it's too high. That was a fastball. Very high. And the count on Dick Bartell. Ball one and strike one. First inning, one man out. Nobody on. Here's the pitch. Inside, ball two. Lefty Gomez trying to keep that ball inside for Dick Bartell. The outfield moved over just a little bit toward right field. Left center and right field are playing over a bit. And a big hit. Just the bag. Now the left field ball is carried off the wall. Oak has it. The throw the second drive. He's back to first base. And it's a big hit for Dick Bartell. That was a ripping smash just inside the third base cushion. The ball going down the left field corner. It carried off the feet by Holt. Holt returning the ball to Frank Rossetti and driving Dick Bartell back to first base. Carol the knock. The giant third baseman. Seems rather strange to say the giant third baseman. For many years, he was the right fielder. Here's the pitch. Strike call. A beautiful hook ball. It caught the inside corner of the plate with Carol stepping back. First inning, one man out. Dick Bartell on first. Carol left-hand batter, is in the box. Ball two. A slow, sweeping curveball that missed the outside corner, and the count on Mel is one and one. George Hicks told you it's kind of a dark day. What's the advantage of Gomez? It's a high foul ball going in the boxes over and back of third base, and it's strike two. Strike two, and ball one. Very, very few vacant seats upstairs. The last two tiers. And in the mezzanine, the last tier and a half. And in the main floor, just the last tier. The same thing is prevalent in the right field floor. The pitch. The high fly ball in field. Luke Gehrig. Luke Gehrig under it. He has it. Two out. Big Bartell on first. And Hank Lieber coming up. center field this afternoon, Jimmy Ripple in right field and Joe Moore in left field. It was thought for a while that Chiozzi might play center field for the Giants, but that has been changed and Lieber will be in center. Here it is. Ball one. Last ball was over, but just a little bit too high. Hank Lieber. That's some right-handed. This is the first inning. Two out. Nick Bartell on first. It's a foul back. The hit and run was on that time. Dick Bartell was off with Lefty Gomez motion. Ran all the way down to second base. And now he trots back. The umpire's arms be behind the bat. Morris at first. Steve Bass was at second. And Bill Stewart umpiring at third. Of course, the umpires would shift around each day. Rotate. All right. The count of Lieber is strike one. Ball one. Strike two. Makes a mighty swing. He wasn't fooling on that one. Swung hard and missed it. And the count is strike two and ball one. The Giants being the visiting club today, batting first. Two men out. Bartell on first. Here it is. Inside. Lefty Gomez thought he had a corner on that one, but it was inside. And the count is strike two and ball two. DiMaggio and Selkirk are playing plenty deep. Two and two, coming. Strike three. Strike three. Hard and no run. One hit and no errors. Play a ball game, Warren. Come in. Yes, Tom, and the noticeable thing in that first half inning was the respect that the Giants evidently have for the throwing arms of these Yankee outfielders. That ball that 
Martell hit over third base was normally one on which he would try for second base, but he made his round of first and half-heartedly and then turned back to first. They evidently have heard that the arms of Hogue and DiMaggio and that Yankee outfield can throw that ball around. The other noticeable thing, which I think we might as well refer now, is that the rains of last night have slowed down this field to a considerable extent. I notice that as the boys run around out there, they're digging up large uh, sort of divots in the turf, and I'm afraid that there will not be any too much speed shown until the place dries out a little. And as the sun is now coming out strong, it probably will be dry and, as they say, at the track pass before the afternoon is over. Gomez, in striking out uh, Lieber to end the inning, departed from his orthodox fashion of firing that ball through there. The last strike was slowed up, and it threw Lieber completely off his stride, and it was an interesting pitch. All right, Tom, here's the first hitter. Mike, keep this in mind. Brennan and Gumbert gone out the right field bullpen to warm up. It'll be Carl Hubble, you know, left hand with the box for the Giants. Carlos won 22 and lost eight. 33 years old, long, lanky left-hander. The first hitter will be Frank Rossetti. Play the wind-up. Ball one. A hook ball was low inside. Rossetti switching around up there. Stepped away, took it, and the count is one and nothing. Red Rolfe, the Yankee third baseman, will be next. Bending over now, he's taking just a little bit of time. He always starts off rather slow as along about the fourth inning, cuts it up a little. Ball one, inside. And the count is two and nothing. On that giant infield, this fell out at third base. Dick Bartell at short, Burgess White hit at second, and Johnny McCarthy at first. Hubble is in the box, and Van Cusel doing the catch. Goes out up, the count ball two. The pitch. Oh, a burning fastball right down the old alley, about felt high. Frankie Crosetti jumping away from the plate. The long be called it, and the count is called two and strike one. A lot of pepper on that giant infield for the moment. Outside, and it's ball three. Ball three and strike one. That count, ball two and strike one. Tried to come in there with a sweeping curveball over the outside, making Crosetti reach for it, but he refused. Ball was outside, and it's ball three and strike one. No score as yet. Frank Crosetti, first man up for the Yankees in the last half of the first inning. And he got that outfield of Joe Moore in left, Hank Lieber in center, Jimmy Ripple in right. Ball three and strike one. Crosetti, right hander up. Outside, ball four, and Crosetti walks. Red Rolfe, Ripley's third baseman, Ransom, left hand. The Yankee uniforms are white, the home uniform white, the blue stripe, about an inch apart. They're wearing navy blue jerseys, blue caps, blue stocks. The NY, of course, on the top of their cap. Carl Hubble, giant pitcher with the left hander, takes a stretch from peak at first. Here it is. It's in there. A call strike. Nice sharp breaking curve ball that Matt Rolfe started to start away from. He broke over the heart of the plate for a call strike. Joe DiMaggio will be next. He said he has a big lead. Has a play at first. No go. Just to let him know that you're in there. Hubble tossing that ball over with not any great amount of effort. Strike one to count. It's outside. Sharp breaking curveball was plenty low and outside. Gus Van Cuso jumping over fourth. Not even the count on Rolf. Ball one and the strike one. There's the stretch. Peek over to first. There's a play at first. Not even close. Goes any getting back fast. Hubble wasn't burning that ball over to Johnny McCarthy, just letting Roselli know that he's in there. Ball one and strike one coming. It's outside and low. Hubble should have said a little on that. Thank you, so turn around and talk to Ormsby. Burgess 
play that the second baseman has walked in from his spot, yelling something at Hubble. Hubble picks up the rod bag now. Now he's kicking the dirt around on the top of the rubber there. Alon is playing pretty deep third base. Hit runners on, fly ball and back at third base. And it's two and two. That's at least a glimpse of what Joe McCarthy, the manager of the Yankees, might be doing in this series. Instead of getting that sacrifice and playing for the one run, that count ball two and strike one, put the hit run on. Earl Cole's supposed to get first, Arnie Fletcher at third. The count is ball two, strike two. Rosetti on first, result of a base on balls and nobody else. Hubble pitching. Two and two. Over to first base. Toss over there with sort of nonchalantly. Third time he's tossed over there with no particular speed on that toss from the box. Here it is. Smack outside. Ball ball. Fans jump to their feet then. That was a very hard smash. The ball turned all the way around on. Pulled it a little bit too much. It landed about two yards outside the first base cushion. watching in this short Blue Ribbon Classic will be Johnny McCarthy, who will be placed by the Bill Terry at first base. Ed Rolf is in there with the count ball two and strike two. And Rosetti on first, nobody out. Here it comes.
second, but Rossetti gets back. Now we have Luke Gehrig coming up. Gehrig and O'Patchum, left-handed. He's been heading 353 this season. And he's 33 years old. Hasn't missed a ball game since Lord knows when. Double pitching. There it is. Made away curve ball. Missed the outside corner. And it's ball one. Frank Rossetti is on second. Joe DiMaggio on first. Just a couple of Italian boys that know something about this game called baseball. Ball one, Gary Kitty. Here it is. The long drive, high and far out, but not going too far away. Hank Lieber is under it, and he has it. Returns the ball to Burgess Whitehead. Rossetti holding second. DiMaggio holding first. Harry got a hold of that ball. But John Barnes at this Yankee Stadium, you know, are plenty long. And the boys took that ball out there. Not quite out to the center track. Let me give you the figures on this field. It's 301 feet to the left field corner. Then direct left field is 402 feet. Directly in center field is 461. Right center is 407, and on the line, in left field is 296 feet. Of course, it branches out within 30 or 40 feet of that. It's 344 feet back. Right now, we have two men out. And Bill Vicky at bat, the catcher, left-hand batter. Outside, ball one. Kyle Hubble leaning almost back to second base before he cut loose to that ball. Apparently, he's trying to keep that ball over the lower outside corner for Bill Dickey. Dick Bartellis moves over toward the second base cushion. Strike, ball. Ball one, strike one. Mike Rossetti on second. Joe DiMaggio on first, two men up. Walt struck out. Gary flies the lever in center field. Left-hander is in the box of the Giants. Ball one, strike one. Takes a look at second base. Here it is. Strike two, the fifth foul that you can perhaps hear. That's Mancuso making the catch of the ball. And the count is strike two and ball one. Oh, folks, there's a lot of excitement here at Yankee Stadium. The folks have been waiting, you know. It's 12 months for this classic. Down on Bill Dickey now, a strike two and ball one. Outside of the count is two and two. Earl Holt was playing out in left field against the south ball shoots of Kyle Hubble is next. The other left fielder is Jakey Powell. Ball two and strike two. Hubble takes the stretch. It is. Tip foul. Dickey swung over that ball, landed right there at home plate. Fire whips out a new ball, and the Giants smack it around that infield with the rapidity of light. Malak, Dick Bartell, the whitehead to McCarthy, and then back to the pitcher Hubble. Giant outfield is Joe Moore in left, Hank Lieber in center, and Jimmy Ripple in right. Maggio on first, Rosetti on second, two out, Dickey batting, ball two, strike two. Coming. Ball three. A burning fast ball. Still Phil Dickey away from the plate. Haven't had so much on it, but it brought a great stone from the crowd. What's the attendance for him? Someone over 60? Give me the figures on the attendance. Get the same as they made the third of the watch. Full count of three and two. The runners will be off with the pitch. There they go, and here it is. The fly ball going out of the deep center field. Hank Lieber running back. Under it, and he has it. That ball for the Yankees in the first inning. No run. One hit, one base on ball, and no error. Now, radio friends, we pause briefly for station identification. NBC booth in the Yankee Stadium, and the thought that strikes me after watching the Yankees' first attempt at Carl Hubble's pitching in this game, 
is that hub has been a little bit wild to the extent that he's been three and two on most of these hitters. He's been working that ball towards the corners there, pitching very carefully for the simple reason that it is not a good judgment to get that ball any too good for these Yankee hitters. While he was hit for one base hit, the one that Joe DiMaggio splashed past to Mel Ott at third base, that was a sort of a soggy hit, and it wasn't hit with the authority that we are accustomed to watch when the Yankees really get a hold of the ball. So far in the ball game, it has been mostly one of defense with the Yankees furnishing the principal threat, of which, as you know now, nothing came. All right, Tom, it looks like the hitter's up here, so let's have him. It'll be Jimmy Ripple, a giant right fielder. We completed the first inning without any score. One hit apiece. Carl Hubble has issued one base on balls. So far, Lefty Gomez has issued no bases on balls. Jimmy Ripple leading off. Jimmy, the left-hand hitter, the right fielder of the Giants. Here we go. Ball one. That was a fast ball that Gomez had in there, but it was just a little bit too low. McCarthy will be next. Foul ball up and back at third base. Ball one, strike one. Yes, Jimmy broke his bat. Hitting that ball, that's what he did, and he's walking slowly over toward the giant dugout to get a new one. One thing that the ball players just hate to do is to break their back. Tell me, Warren, how'd that ever start? Well, that's just one of those superstitions that's come along in baseball, like somebody who started to hit by wearing their pants long, you know, they used to pull them all up in the old days. One fellow started in like Cal Simmons or somebody like that with his pants down loose, and now pretty nearly everybody does. Ready to go again. Ball one and strike one, ripple hitting. There's a long smash going out to left field. Merle Hope waiting for it. He has it. Jimmy Ripple with the count ball one and strike one. Five to Merle Hogue in medium left field. Johnny McCarthy. First year as a regular with the Giants. They like him here in New York. He's getting a nice hand. He steps into the batter's box. He backs and goes left handed. Lefty Gomez. Outside, ball one. and awful dark here at the moment. A little wind blowing in from the northwest. There's a smack right up with Jerry, and he makes the catch. He looked at the umpire, the umpire, Steve Bass, and waved that it was a unassisted put out. Looked as though Tony just barely got his glove underneath that ball. A terrific line smash right at Tony's feet. He held the ball up, and Steve Basil waved out that Tony Lazari made the catch. Nobody on. First half of the second inning. Thanks, George. That's Van Cuso up. Strike call. Just 31 years old. This season he batted 279. At Yankee outfield. Holds it left. DiMaggio center. Shell turned right. The pitch at the ball. Ball and inside. Ball one and strike one. center field, Selkirk going over fast, and he has it. Very nice running catch by right fielder Georgie Selkirk. Van Cusel hitting that ball on a line in the right center field. Selkirk was off of the track of the bat and made the catch. One. Tom, the uh, noticeable thing there was the fact that all three of these Yankee hitters, or giant hitters, and two of them left-hand hitters, took very solid wallops at the ball. That's the hardest hit of the game to date in the fourth of effectiveness was that line drive that McCarty hit all that was Barry out there. It's interesting to me to find those fellas walking in there against Gomez since in the first inning outside of Bartell's drive over third base they looked a little bit weak but evidently uh, Gomez is not treating them with the same respect that Hubble is treating the Yankee hitters. He's simply firing that ball in and trusting that those nine men in back of them or eight men I should say in back of them and certainly so far they've done a swell job. Two of those catches out there in the outfield were better than ordinary catches, particularly Selkirk's on the last one. So well, here's your first Yankee hitter, Tom. That'll be Merle Hogue. Last half of the second inning, no score as yet. Merle Hogue is 
nine years old. Comes from out Sacramento, California. This season, batting 301. Carl has always been a fine baseball player, but unfortunately, he's been out of the regular lineup on many occasions because the Yankees have always had so much superior outfield. It's Carl Hubbard, you know, a southpaw, Gus Mancuso catching. Last half of the second inning, no score, and Hogan, the hitter. Strike called. Earl Holt stuck his bat out, threw third baseman Mel out in, but of course had no intention of calling that ball, just by way of drawing Mel out in from third base. Ball, low and outside, and the count on Hogan is ball one and strike one. Earl Holt, the batter, Georgie Selker. George has been on the injured and sick list quite a bit during the last half of the season, but he's back in there now, strong as ever. Ball one, strike one. Bounding ball down, third goes foul. Artie Fletcher tried to stop it, got past him, but Mallott retrieved the ball, and then the Giants whip it around the infield. The big Bartell to Whitehead to McCarthy, and finally back to Humphrey. Earl Hogue hit that ball, started to run, was three quarters of the way down to first base. Walking back rather slow. Strike two and ball one. Kyle Hubble winding up. Too high. Over the plate, a little bit high on the count is ball two and strike two. Well, NBC Mike is right over home plate. We're pretty high, but right in line with the pitcher and catcher. Pretty fair seat, in other words. Ball two, strike two. Rounding ball down short. Burgess comes up with it. The throw. He's out. Out by plenty. Put out. Six to three for those who keep the score. That's yes, Warren Brown just gives me a note that that was the first assist to the ball game. Right you are, Warren. Strike out two fly balls. Two flies to center field by carrying a ticket to strike out by Ross. Georgie Selkirk, the right fielder, left-hand batter coming up. George hit 328 this year. George is 29 years old. Hits the first ball, a high hopper. Down second base, Whitehead to McCarthy, and Selkirk is out. Last half of the second inning with no scores yet. Two men have been retired, and boots him up, Tony in this area, and listen to the applause he gets. gentlemen, fine, great ball player. They like him a lot here in New York, and they should. Tony bats him right hand. Ball one outside. Tony is 33 years old. This year, Tony has hit the tennis well as usual, batting around 250. Ball one is the count, two out, nobody out. Strike called. Hubble had a nice fast ball over the inside corner with Lazari pulling away. Well, he gets a handful of dirt there, drying his hands off. And the count will be ball one and strike one. Last half of the second inning, no score is yet, two out, nobody out. There's the, the hot smash back to Hubble. He knocked it down, picks it up, tosses it to McCarthy, and this area is out. That ball was hit right smack on the nose, and the applause is for that stop of Kyle Hubble. No run, no hit, no errors, no score at the conclusion of two innings. Four.
of the first half of the third inning. In the National League entry, the Giants coming to bat. And their second baseman, Burgess Whitehead. Burgess, 26 years old this year, he hit 286. Lefty Gomez winds up. Ball on. Burning fast ball over the plate, but too low. One hit apiece so far. There's a bounding ball through the box. A close shot by Cosetti to throw. He's out. A beautiful play by Frankie Cosetti. That was a pounding ball just out of the reach of Lefty Gomez. Frankie Cosetti was off for the crack of the bat, took that ball right over the second base cushion, right on the air, flipped it over to Ruth Gary for the putout. The applause is for Paul Hubble. Listen to Pitches left-handed and bats him right-handed. One out, nobody on. A foul upstairs. Well, there wasn't much of a scramble for that ball. It was hopped right into the waiting hands of a gentleman who I do not believe is going to toss it back. Here we go. Ball inside. Sharp breaking hook ball. Just a little bit close. And the count is ball one and strike one on Carl Hubble. Inside on a ball two. Let's see Gomez that funny on that one. It's getting quite dark here at Yankee Stadium in New York. Inside of advantage, I'd say, for Lefty Gomez. Fireball pitch. There's a long track going out to high field cover going back and near the wall and makes the catch. That ball was hit exactly 340 feet from home plate. Shelford taking that ball just about four feet in front of the barrier, out in deep right field. Mr. Hubble tagged that ball very, very well. It's a base hit in an awful lot of ballparks. But not here in Spacey's Yankee Stadium. Two out. First half of the third inning, no score yet. One score at the top of the batting order coming up. It's Joe Moore. Last time up he was out, Gary Gunnison. A strike called. Lefty Gomez pitching, and so Vicky the catcher. Coming. Ball two, another shot breaking third ball is outside. Direction, ball one, strike one. Ball and one. Ball two. Back ball. Over the plate, but just a little bit low. And it's ball two and strike one. Lefty drop that one was good enough. Here's the windup. Ball two and strike one. Foul back. And the count is two and two. Joe Moore coming up for the second time. Lead off man of the Giants the first time up. He was out. Gary Gunnison. After the up cross that ball to Dickey, the Yankees whipped it around the infield. Lefty Gomez taking his glove off. Nice putting it back down in the box. And here we go. Ball two, strike two. Oh, a hot smash right back to Gomez. A similar play that ended the Yankee time at bat. A hard smash through the box to Lefty Gomez. Grabbed his glove hand, tossed over to first for the put out. No runs, no hits, no errors. Mr. Brock. All right, Mr. Manning. The uh, surprising thing, I think, of these last two innings, as far as the Yankees are concerned, is their presentation in a new light. Here before, all of us that have been writing and talking about the Yankees have been mentioning their power at the plate. These last two innings have shown them to be a very snappy defensive ball club. Every one of those plays in the last inning and every one of the plays in the second inning was a very deftly handled ball, by whether it was outfielders or infielders. That play that Frank Rossetti made down in second base there was, I think, the most uh, spectacular one so far. The outfield has certainly performed up to a standard that we didn't expect since we regarded them strictly as hitters. All right, Tom. A round of applause that's seeping through your loudspeaker now is for El Dupi Gomez, who's pitching this afternoon for the Yankees. Well, he doesn't get very many pace hits during the regular season. When he gets one, it's always the most colorful picture. That happens to happen this afternoon when Brian watches every move and transfer it to you. 
Last half of the third inning, we have no scores yet. The Yanks coming to bat. And the pitcher, Lefty Gomez, who bats them and throws them left hand. Hubble. Pounding ball down to Whitehead. An easy chance to play to McCarthy and Gomez is up. feeble swing that Lefty took at that ball. Nice easy hopper that Burgess Whitehead took knee high and tossed it over to Johnny McCarthy for the out. Again, the top of the Yankee batting order coming up. Frankie Gozzetti, one of the three Italian boys that play on the Yankee team. And Cuso and Chiosa, the Italian boys in the giant team. Last time up, Gozzetti drew a face on ball. The pitch ball one, it's low outside. First game of the World Series. Boys will play four out of seven. Two here at Yankee Stadium, and then we move over to the Polo Ground. There we go. Strike ball. Now had a fastball in there, right over the heart of the plate, up high. A call strike, and the call is ball one and strike one. Last half of the third inning. Yankees batting, one out, nobody on. That was over the plate, a little bit too low, and the count is ball two and the strike one. Red Rolf, third baseman, the head back. Frankie Grosetti, right hand batter is up, ball two and strike one. It is inside, ball three. Frankie Grosetti is a tough little boy to pitch to. Always wiggling up there, giving the pitcher no target to shoot at. One out, nobody on. Hubble winds up at ball three and strike one. It's in there, a cold strike. Well, had that one in there, fell high and right over the heart of the plate. Frank Rosetti elected to work out the string, and the foul is ball three and strike two. Three and two, and this is the big one. Winding up. There's a long drive going to left field. It's high by one foot. Clear down in the corner. Everybody jumped to their feet. We waited for a moment to make sure that that ball was outside, not more than a foot down the left field corner, and that perhaps is the hardest hit ball of the afternoon. That count three and two. Carl Hubble came in there with a fast ball, much to the liking of Frank Gossetti, who had a trovo. In anticipation of just that kind of a pitch, and he nailed it. A low line drive that went crickety scoop down on that left field corner and was followed by not more than a foot. Nice bit of umpiring there by Phil Stewart. He certainly was on that play. Ready to go. Three and two the count. Foul high. Grant Fuso ripped off his mask, got it back, but it's in the stand. Frankie Crozetti has a count of ball three and strike two. Red on the feet. Umpire behind the plate this afternoon. Each time he tosses that ball out, the boys sort of dirty it up a little bit with a little of that infield dirt. Ready to go again. Hubble has the ball. Ball three and strike two. Fouled it down third. It's fouled by not too much. So close to being a fair ball, the fell out, grabbed it, puts it over to first base. Frankie has his eye on that hot corner. Frankie's a little fellow, not very heavy, but he certainly can pull those balls down for third base. Playing the last half of the third inning. Yankees at bat with one out, nobody on. Frankie Rosetti up with a full count. There's the wind up. High ball going out to left field. Joey Moore didn't move very much if he has it. Frank Rosetti is a long left field hitter. Joey Moore, the giant left fielder, was playing out there pretty near to the track. Only moved about four or five yards to make that catch. Now we have two out. Nobody on. Let ball put back. Trips to the plate. Rosetti threw a base on balls and tried to go more in left field. Red Rolf up. Last time up, he struck out. Two out, nobody on. 
Hubble winds up. It's a ball. Sweeping third ball, not too fast. That's the outside corner. And the count on Rolf is ball one. Not quite as dark here now as it was while the Giants were at bat. No sunshine or anything like that, but lightening up a little bit. Cut that one down left field with a disturbing foul into the stand. And the count is ball one and strike one. Back in the batter's box. Again, Carl Hubble has a new ball. That's the cleanest looking ball that we've seen out there this afternoon. Ball one and strike one. Two out. And nobody on. Fly ball going out to left field. Joey coming over to the line under it. He takes it, and that's all for the Yankees in the third inning. No runs, no hits, no errors. One. There's no reason to suspect, Tom, that uh, these pitchers aren't still in complete control of the ball game. Hubble has been almost perfect, I might say, since the first inning. Outside of uh, Frank Rossetti, who hit a ball rather sharply into left field, and Rolf, who just hit a dinky fly out to Joe Moore, none of the others have been able to get the ball past the infield. Hubble seems to have recovered whatever lack of control it was that he started out at in the game. He's getting that ball just about where he wants it. And with these two clubs having a pretty good understanding of such weaknesses, if weaknesses exist in the other side's offensive array, why I think Carl will go along pretty well. He seems to be perfectly self-contained, whereas Gomez, on the other hand, is just as effective and seems to be perfectly content with the way things are going on. I don't know if that I blame it. All right, Tom. Yeah. All right, we're going into the first half of the fourth inning. We ought to get a bit of excitement now. On both sides, we have Martel, Ott, and Lieber coming up for the Giants. And in the fourth inning, all the Yankees will have coming up will be DiMaggio, Gehrig, and Dick. Group coaching at first and Snyder at third for the Giants. Here we go. Martel up. Gets the first ball. Fits the mighty drive going deep. Both going back on the cylinder track, and he has it. Run out. Nick Martell, as I told you in the first inning, is a long left field hitter. He got a hold of that first ball pitch. It was a high ball, a better high. Stepped into it, drove it deep out into left field with Holt. He was playing deep, running back near the cylinder track, and making the catch. Now we have Melvin Ott coming up. Years old. He batted 294 this year. Last time up, he flies the first baseman, Lou Gary. The first pitch, ball one. Sharp breaking curve ball with a slow outside to a left hand hitter. Ball two. Fast ball right under Bell's chin. Stepped away from the plate. Now the car is two and up. First half of the fourth inning. There's a bounding ball through the box. The Zoe goes over, makes the play. It's close. He's out. Boy, what a play that was by Tony Lazzari. That was a bounding ball over the head. All Lefty Gomez, Tony Lazzari, running away from first base, grabbed that ball to his right, and leaped, covered it, shot the ball over to Ruth Carey, just ahead of Mella. Only by about one step. Two outs, nobody on. Beautiful play by Tony. The best play of the game so far. Hank Lieber is up. Right hand hitter. Strike. He swings and misses. Two very beautiful infield plays there. One by Crosetti and this one by Tony Lazzari. Strike one. Lieber hitting. Strike two. Makes a fighting cut up that shot. Breaking third ball. Swung over it and it's strike two. Field fly ball and back of second base. Lazzari, the gel for it, under it, he has it. That's all for the Giants in the fourth inning. No runs, no hits, no errors. One. All right, Tom, the uh, thing that I've been waiting for since this World Series game began just appeared out there now. We've heard Shell throughout the summer that maybe Tony Lazzari, the veteran of many a campaign up here with the Yankees, was slowing down a little bit. Well, he certainly gave no evidence in that play that he made out there in this last inning when he ranged over that 
to second base and came up with the ball. The fact that he got in front of the ball was not so much a part of the play as his ability to throw while definitely out of position. He was getting rid of that ball almost while he was running straight away from where he had to throw it. And the two uh, activities combined gives Tony at the present time the lead for the spectacular feeling in this series. All right, Tom, here's Joe DiMaggio now. All right, the big guns of the Yankees. One of the big reasons why the Yankees have been far out with front in the American League. DiMaggio, Jerry, and Dickinson. Right outfield, playing way back. Jimmy Ripple is standing still out the other side of the track, standing out there about 360 feet from home plate, waiting for DiMaggio to hit. Here we go, Hubble pitching. Ball one. Start breaking curve balls. Put outside. That's be the Joe Moore playing right on the track. It's approximately 380 feet from home plate. Certainly play Joe DiMaggio deep. And they should. The bounding ball between first and second. Whitehead coming over. The throw, he's out. Joe hit that ball right on the tip of his bat. And it was a sizzling little crowder down between first and second. Look for a moment. He had a chance to beat it out for play. Dennis Bass came over, scooped the ball up, got it to Johnny McCarthy at first, and DiMaggio is out. Lou Gehrig got it. Last time up, Lou Gehrig got a hold of the ball, but he hoisted it much too high, giving center field of Hank Fever a chance to get under it for the put off. Giant pitcher, Carl Hubble, having the perspiration from his trowel. Now he's ready to go. Gehrig the hitter. Left hand batter. Up. Strike called. Boy, from a Hubble strip. He had a lot on that one. Fast as ball. He's crossed all afternoon. Right over the heart of the plate. There it is. Outside. Ball one. Strike one. Oh, yeah. Hart sort of begins to beat double quick time when this baby Gehrig stepped up to that plate. What a picture. Big broad shoulders and big strong arms. One and one. Oh! Clear over the stand. Over the back of first base. It's quite a hoist to get him over the stand there at Yankee Stadium with three decks, you know. Strike two, four, one. Starting in the fourth inning, and it's quite a ball game. A pitcher's battle so far, each side having one base hit. Maggio getting a hit for the Yanks, and Bartell for the Giants. Strike two and ball one. Inside, driving Gehrig away from the plate, and the count is ball two and strike two. Got your Bill Dickey hanging around home plate. He'll be next. Bartell is playing over... Almost in back of second base. Whitehead has shifted over between first and second. McCarthy playing two yards from the line. Here we go. Gary swung the ball ball, ripped the money, and it's a strike out. Carl Hubble came in there fast and started breaking the ball. Looked like it was coming over the part of the plate. Gary started the swing, and the third thing tried to hold the swing, but he was going in there so hard, unable to hold it, and swung around, missing that ball by several feet. Looked kind of bad on that one. For a strike down, two gone, and nobody out. Always a picture with that Gary at that place. And that was a real picture he wore to tell you about it the moment. All right, Bill Dickey up, two out, nobody out. It's in there for a cold strike. You'll notice that from Gary, Dickey came to bat. Hubble struck the first ball in there, a straight ball with all the speed that he has at his command, keeping the ball. Just a little above the knee. Full, good pitcher. The bounder down first. McCarthy has it. McCarthy running the bag for the put out. Unassisted. No run. No hit. No error. No score. The conclusion of four innings. Four. Now, the interesting thing to me in that inning was uh, at the time that Jerry was at the bat. I happened to be looking down into the giant dugout, and Bill Terry is down there, sort of out in front of his players. And to distinguish him from the rest of them, he has a towel around his neck. I've been trying to figure out for several innings why that was, but I gathered he was waving his outfielders around, particularly his center fielder, Hank Lieber. He was steering him around with the aid of his arm and the towel, and I can 
see now that uh, the distance that these giant outfielders play away from the plate and naturally away from their own dugout with Garrick at the plate, it's no wonder that Bill needs a towel around his neck. From that distance, one giant looks the same as another. This is the first time that I've noticed Gary taking that active part in the direction of his outfielders during the progress of play, but it was quite interesting to me. All right, Tom, here comes the next one. Now we're going into the first half of the fifth inning. The guys are beginning to group in unison. This time it happens to be for the time. One, I thought Carl Hubble was getting a little better as he moves along. What's your opinion of that? He broke off at Gehrig. I think Tom was the finest breaking curve that was thrown by either one of these pitches this afternoon. At least that was the way it looked to me. It didn't start out as a bad pitch, but it broke so sharply that it made Gehrig look bad. Didn't you think so? Yes, sir. Well, here we go. Give me a ripple. Right fielder, first man up. Ball one. The ball was outside. Last time up, ripple fly to left field. has moved back over the center track. Joe DiMaggio has moved over right center field. Strike. Ball. Ball one, strike one. Lefty Gomez pitching. Drive down the left is foul. Floor goes up from the crowd there. They, some of the fans are on a different, different angle than we are. It's a little longer to see whether that ball is curving foul or not. All right, it's strike two and ball one. First half of the fifth inning, no score as yet. Each of the teams, the Giants and Yanks, have made one hit. Ball two, a fast ball that knocked Jimmy Ripple down. That's the first ball of the product that's knocked down this afternoon, getting out of the way of the ball. Ball two and strike two. Lefty Gomez pitching through Dickey Cat. Two and two. The foul back. And the count remains two and two. Ripple got a piece of a good curveball from Gomez that time. Well pitched ball. It was breaking over the outside corner. Umpire caught down a loop ball. Gave it a Dickey. Dickey shot it down the wall. Rolf got some dirt and rubbed it up, and now Ormsby has asked for the ball again. Crosses out another ball. He's telling Bill Dickey now to stop throwing that ball in the dirt. Just a little by play by the boys. Nothing serious. Gangs threw that ball around the infield. Now Gomez has it. We're ready to go again. Jimmy Ripple. The hitter. There's a face back in the way. Out there, Kirk has it, and so is the second ripple stopping at first. Second giant hit of the afternoon. That count two and two. Empty Gomez came in there with a straight ball inside. Ripple pulled away and pulled the ball with it to right field for a base stop. Johnny McCarthy coming up, the first baseman. Tall boy, Batson throws left handed. Last time up, fly to the Terry. The first pitch, plenty wide of the plate, a beautiful stop by Bill Dickey, ball one. It was a curve ball that started to break over the outside corner. By the time it was finished, it was on the outside of the right handed batter's box. Here it comes, ball two, again it's outside. There are a lot of giant fans here in Yankee Stadium this afternoon. Something that time. 
Anyway, Dickey wanted to find out, and inside baseball, he called for a pitch out. Here it is. The call upstairs, Blake. Ball one, and Blake one. Left man Cusel, the, the giant catcher, is the right hand batter. Last time up, he flies the right field. First half of the fifth inning. No scorers yet. And the Giants have runners on first and third. Ripple on third, McCarthy on first. Ball one, strike one. Here it is. Strike two. A beautifully pitched ball. Right under the handle of the bat. Over the inside corner with Van Cusel taking a terrific cut. It's strike two and ball one. Johnny McCarthy staying pretty close to first base. Luke Gary holding him on there. Here it is. The long drive to right field going foul. It is. It's foul in the stands and the count remains two and one. And Cusel reaching outside for that pitch. that ball around the infield not very rapidly but each one of them feeling the ball the Yankee infield is playing back when well, you give up that run on third base apparently here's the pitch another foul that one's upstairs upstairs and back at first base that's Van Cusel the batter at strike two and ball one take a look at that picture for you second base combination Crosetti and Rosario are playing pretty deep that ball is playing deep enough. Gary gets down in the bag holding McCarthy there. Gomez tosses over to Gary. Go to have started. Just letting McCarthy know that he's in there. It's right two and ball one. Van Cusel up. Gomez stretches. Here it is. The foul ball to Rosetti. Rosetti to Rosetti. Out at second. Out at first. A double play. And Ripple crosses the plate. And he got that with Ripple on third base. McCarthy on first. Van Cusel it's a ground ball to Cosetti. Cosetti picked it up, talked to Missouri, getting McCarthy. Missouri to Gary, getting Van Cusel. A double play, and the score of the Giants won the Yankees nothing. Now we have Burgess Whitehead coming up. The Giants' second base, the right-hand batter. Last time up, he was out short to first. The pitch right down the alley, a call strike. Lefty Gomez, you know... The fans throughout the circuit haven't appreciated the fire ball that he possesses, but he's got a lot of it. Outside of it's a ball, ball one and strike one. Many of the ball players have said that Gomez has a ball. He throws just quickly as fast as Bob Fellow, a lefty Bob throw. Ball one and strike one. There's a long smash to right field. It's ball by two yards down the right field corner. Again, the fans jump to their feet on that line smash by Burgess Whitehead. I believe we've had more shots down the ball lines in this particular game than any game we've seen in a long time. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, don't take Tom. <laughs> Ready to go again. Gomez has the glove off for a moment. And the count is strike two and ball one. First half of the fifth inning. The Giants batting two out, nobody on. The wind-up. There's a face knock over Gary's head down to the right field corner. Ball pans off the wall. He's going to second. There's the ball. He goes to the second standing up. And the first extra face hit of the World Series. Going again. Has a pounding ball to Gary. Gary comes up with it. Steps 
on the bag for the put out. That's all for the Giants in the fifth inning. One run, three hits, and no error. We've completed four and a half innings of this first game of the Blue Ribbon Classic. This is Carl Manning speaking. I've enjoyed it thoroughly working with you, Warren, to broadcast the view of the radio audience. And the remaining part of the ball game will be broadcast by Red Barber of Cincinnati, Ohio. Before Red comes in, Warren Brown. All right, Tom. Left-handers today, and both of them flirting with Lady 
luck as both are wearing 11. However, the name cannot smile both ways at the same time. Hubble has never lost an opening World Series game, and Gomez has never lost a World Series game. So somebody is going to get hurt before this day is over. Hubble pitching to Lazari. Ball strike two. He picks up the inside corner just under the ladder. Right over the short rim. Nothing in two. Two out. Nobody on. Last to the fifth inning. Giants ahead one to nothing. Not feel sharp at one left. Greg Lazari is an out, not full hitter. The pitch. Is into the dirt in front of the plate. Ball one. The first time that Pavel has thrown anything that looked wild. However, that's not a wild pitch. A wild pitch is only so scored when there's a runner on base to advance and take advantage of it. Just ball one. One and two. Pavel has retired the last 13 Yankees in a row. Given up just one hit, one base on ball, and that's coming in the first inning. First third of the first inning. Swinging stretch, delivers outside, a curve that did not come down and in to a right hand hitter thrown by left handers. Two and two. Down at shortstop, purple box, big box L. Visiting with the uniform, putting his cap down. Bellock, the reformed right fielder who's done a great job at third base. Who's a little dirt, who's had his terrain around him. He's pulled over pretty close to the foul line. Whitehead is over almost back to second base. There's a 2 2 pitch. For Carl Hubble. And for the first time, pitching with a one run lead, he makes it look just that much better. Bob is now retired the last 14 men in a row. We pause for our station identification. Stadium and in the NBC booth at the top of the stand looking over the World Series. And the strong point about Hubble now, since uh, Red has told you how he's been rolling everybody down since the first inning, is that in these latter stakes, it seems to me he's making the Yankees hit that bad ball. That last pitch on which Tony Lazari struck out wasn't a very good pitch, but he lashed at it rather wildly. That would indicate to me that Hubble has the boys on the hip. Thank you. 
Chris who throws out of the shoulder. Fastball wide and it's one and one. One away. Two more. Very fleet. Knows his way around those bases, leading down off first. Talking Luke Garrick, the endurance player of all baseball, both the corner against him. Luke, a coaching back of first. This on is strike two call. A lead sharp hook down just above the knee. You see these fast balls thrown by Gomez? And then you look at him, slender, willowy, sending himself into a press with big game when he throws, you wonder where he gets the strike. On swinging, it's a high foul, up and back into the upper deck. Yankee Stadium has the ground floor, the first level, then a mezzanine, and then a still higher upper deck. So three floors of spectators, not quite a sellout, a few hundred seats are left. Fancuso, 
doesn't look at all sympathetic. Squatting down, Mr. Crouch now stands up. Gomez dried off his hands. He couldn't get them quite dry rubbing along his uniform, and one of the giants threw them the giant batter's rod bag. He used it and tossed it back. Ball one, of course. Out the little toward left. Up the cheek. High inside. Ball two. Thank you, so turns over that ball. Umpire Orms being who examines it. Takes it out of play. And another one's put in. Turns straight back to Hubble. Two nothing to Gomez. First up. Last of the sixth inning. The Giants lead the Yankees one to nothing. They got that run. Top of the fifth. Hubble to sign the last 14 Yankees in a row. Number two nothing. Inside and high for ball three. Hub is behind on his control now for the first time since he walked for Zanny. First up against him in the ball game. Earl Combs coaching back of third. Uh, coaching back of first. Fletcher back of third. Both of them setting out a hoop and a hour. Gomez trying to play from the high and ahead three nothing. Hub comes in. And gets it. The automatic strike. Three and one. This is the knees. Now on. Playing up close by third. Up tries three one. And registers. Strike two ball. Up behind three nothing. Has thrown his last two pitches right through there. Picked up his cap for a moment. Wiped the first break off his forehead. It's a hot and muggy, steaming sort of an afternoon. So he was sitting in the upper deck of a double ball. Up ready for the 3-2 pitch, aims it. It swung on and Carl tipped back. The first time the Gomez has offered it one. Up this time, first and the last of the sixth. You've offered in the way, by way of third baseman Ott. Coming it up, walks calmly over toward the mound. There are two rather cool customers. Ott at third. Up along the mound. Another cool one, Mancuso, under that bat. Right side of the infield, throwing it up between them. Hobby and Whitehead. The hub, an easy swinging stretch. He doesn't wind up. He loves. Low end side for ball four. Oh, I'm giving up two walks. Gomez hasn't walked anyone. And both times, Hubble has walked the Yankee. He has dabbed the old baseball axiom that the walk, the first batter up in the inning, is fatal. Hubble by passing Gomez, his opposing pitcher, first up in the last of the six. Puts the potential high going on first and nobody else. Now let's see how the Yankees go about trying to get back this one run. One run through the season hasn't meant anything at all to the Yankees. But one run against Hubble in a short series such as the World Series can mean a lot. But after all, when the ball game's over, one run's a whole lot if you haven't got it. Gomez leading down off first, not very far. Caught the start of the corner against him. Frank Pazetta, the lead off, is up there. He's been on once with a walk. First inning. Outfield is pulled around to the left. He's right hand hitter. There's a throw down to first out of time. This goes by outside for ball one. Gomez ran down off first a little bit. And when Mancuso took that outside pitch and threw to first, it was cut off by McCarthy, who had run in anticipating a bunt on the part of Gazzetti. So even if Gomez had been a long way off first, which he was, there was nobody at first base to tag him. Hot pulled up, stepped back to the grass at third. Whitehead pulled up on the baseline at second. There's an attempted bunt, which is fouled back onto the screen. One and one. Frank Gazzetti. With a high, piercing voice. Can be heard from short, regardless of the size of the crowd. Up there, hitting right-handed. Counts one and one. Mancuso. Draws for time, walks out to the mound, talking to Hubble. And now both men of the giant battery have their caps off, and both are rubbing the beads of perspiration off of their faces. Mancuso, with a great big handkerchief, now he stuffed it back in his pocket. Comes stumping, started the back of the plate. Swarthy little Gus Mancuso. Been a lot more to the giant pitching than most people realize the last few years. The bench pulled up on the infield, outfield, as usual depth and around toward left. Pizzetti up, counts one and one, nobody out. Gomez off first. Up pitches. There's another attempted punt and it's foul back. Strike two. Ups come right in with these last two pitches. 
Pizzetti has not been able to lay them down. One and two. Somebody out. On deck to get after Pizzetti. He's wrong. But Nasty going to be trying to throw a double play ball right now. There's been one double play in the ball game. That was hit into by Mancuso as he got credit for batting in the one run so far of the struggle in the fifth inning. Runners on first and third. Scored one to nothing. The Giants. Ball game here at Yankee Stadium. Sort of a cloudy, smoky afternoon. Pizzetti waiting now behind one and two. Hot pitches. Pizzetti swings. The line flying down in the back. There's a base hit. Joe Moore takes it on the first bounce. Gomez holds that second. A sharp single for Pizzetti into left field. A long single. And I imagine the guys wish now that Pizzetti hadn't fouled off those two pitches when he was trying to bunt. Bubble, after getting 14 straight Yankees, walked Gomez. The second pass he's given up. Walked Gomez, first up in the last of this sixth inning. And Pizzetti, after vainly trying twice to sacrifice, swung on a 1-2 pitch and did a clean line drive single to left. That's the second hit off Hubble. And now the tying run is at second and nobody is out, and the batter is red Roth. The giant defense is pulled in after the second. This is going to be a bunt. Roth takes high outside. Mancuso throws the second, and Gomez is saved as the ball gets away from Bartel. Mancuso has Gomez picked up second base, but his throw gets away from shortstop Bartel. And Gomez slides back in and is safe. He was absolutely caught off on second base. A pitch out coming down to Roth. Outside for ball one. And Cuso throwing to the third base corner of second. And Gomez cleanly caught off. And it is an error on the play for Bartel. The first error of the series. Bartel letting Mancuso throw get away when Gomez was put cleanly off second. An error for Bartel. And Gomez remains at second base. Roth, left hand hitter, standing close to him, back of the plate. Hot pitches. Roth takes high outside. Mancuso threatens to go around to second, but this time Gomez is glued to the bag. He learned his lesson the easy way just now. And we're having excitement here in the last of the sixth as the Yankees are threatening to rise into their what's before it power strike. Rough up the Matthew on deck. Up the juice. Inside for ball three. And Roth at the head. Covered it behind with this control. This New York crowd at the moment seems to be a Yankee crowd. Judging from the way they are applauding these balls, the Hubble is missing the plate with to Red Rock, the Yankee third baseman. Nobody out in the sixth. Presetti is at first. Gomez is at second. Roth up there. Three nothing. Up comes in, and Roth takes strike one call. Roth up there, wiggling and dancing. Much of a barefooted dancer on the sand of the Sahara at high noon, trying to disconcert Hub and make him miss his talk. Out of the shoulder. There's a bunt foul. Black foul to third. Three one pitch. It was attempted bunt. It was fouled off. All right, three and two. Up walk around back of that mound. So this was just batting practice. I think that's one of his greatest assets. And is never unnerved. I think the way Hubble pitches, especially in times of stress in baseball, is a good lesson for most of us in the everyday world. Just very quietly. He keeps his chin out and keeps going as best he knows how. Three and two. Runners lead off first and second. Swung on. Fouled. Right over into the Yankee dugout. Still three and two. Pace is rather slow. The Giants become thinkers. In a clutch, they figure out everything they're going to do. And they're saying that everybody on the ball club knows exactly what the defensive move will be. Drying off that left hand of his. Throws away the rod and bag. Steps up onto the rubber. Shrugs his shoulders. Take a look at those runners. Now looks down, takes the sign from Mancuso. He's staying in his crouch. Rob crouching left hand hitter over the plate. Hub pitches. 
There's a high foul coming up and back. And Cuso coming back, back, cannot get it. It lands just back on the screen. Still three and two. Still the old blood pressure keeps pounding away up there at, at a baseball high for excitement. The Giants drew first blood this afternoon. The only blood so far that's been left. They got a run in the fifth inning. They're leading by that margin, one to nothing. However, here in the last of the six, a walk, a single, and then an error allows Yankees to be at first and second and nobody off. The three two count is to Red Rock. Up looks around, Gomez leads off second, Zedek comes down off first. Up pitch a three two. There, comes it out into that center field. It's a hit. Gomez holds up back third base, and the bases are loaded. A single to left center field. And the bases are full, and nobody off. In the last of the sixth, and now the Dynamiters, DiMaggio, Gary, and Dickey. Here's the program. <laughs> Down in the giant bullpen, one of the relief pitchers is being warmed up, but he is completely hidden from view. So we can't tell you who it is. You cannot see in either team's bullpen here at the stadium the potential relief pitchers as they groom themselves to get ready. A single into left center field by Rock. Advances to Freddy to second base and Gomez to third. They both had to hold to see whether Joe Moore could come in and make the catch which he couldn't. Now the base is loaded. Nobody out. Pass to the sixth inning. Joe DiMaggio, jolting Joe is up there. Right hand hitter, deep wide spread. He spread eagle right through the middle of batter's box. Gomez leading off third, Presetti off second. Off down off first. The defense is deep around toward left. Up delivers. It's swung on. It's a big hit. In comes Gomez, Presetti around third. is heading for the plate. Two runs are in. And runners are on first and second. Giants, and they're threatening to do still more here in the last of the sixth of this first game. 
John Hitter defense right up on the base path. Bases jammed. Runners at all three points. Dickey waiting. Takes low. Ball two. One just run to the knees. Ball two. Two to one. The Yankees in this inner city series. Hubble, one of the toughest spots of his life. It's a sweltering hot afternoon. Cloudy. Hutton has extra heat applied to him right now at the moment, aside from the weather. Mickey waiting. He's ahead. Two nothing pitch. Swung on as a ground ball. The bases remain full and the run scores. Yes, 
Alonso walks sadly out to the mound. Hubble is finished. And back in the dark resources of the giant bullpen will come another of Jerry's mound crew to assume a burden which apparently was left in the last game of the 1936 series. It seems as though we are right back beginning today where we left off last fall. A conference out there on the mound. Hubble still standing around. Whitehead has come in from second. Bartell, Mancuso. Harry Gumbert. Harry Gumbert. Tall young right-hander. Is coming in to relieve Paul Hubble. Eight of the Yankees faced Hubble in the last of the sixth inning. Seven of them got safely on and five of them have scored. Harry Gumbert. Very tall. Making that long walk. The bullpen for the Giants is hidden in the stands behind right center field. He has to make all that distance as he comes into the ball game. In other words, he gets pretty well acclimated before he ever gets to the mound. Gumbert first announced over the loudspeaker, and now Kaufman, and it is Dick as he steps to the mound. It's Dick Kaufman, the former American leader. Before the relief pitcher came into sight, Gumbert was announced as replacing Hubble. But after the pitcher came into sight, it was announced as Kaufman. Dick Kaufman, right-hander, who has been prominent as the Giants' number one relief man for the last couple of years. Kaufman throwing down to Mancuso. We've had so much fireworks lately while Kaufman's limbering up. Warren, how have you seen it? Well, I, it seems a long time to go back that far, Red, but I'm still thinking about that play at second base when the ball got away from Dick Bartell after it seemed as though Mancuso had trapped him off. And it was amazing the way the Yankees leaped into action after that break, which was very definitely the break for which they've been waiting throughout this entire ball game. It's also interesting to me to note that when Gomez had his bad inning, which was the fifth, he managed to escape from there. With one run, when it came time for the Yankees to tear after Hubble, one thing or another, combined with their own powerful hitting, particularly those singles, which were hit with a great deal of authority, certainly ruined his afternoon for him very rapidly. There was uh, one possible play in this inning, a play that uh, Whitehead tried to make on the ball Bill Dickey kept down. It was a slow hit ball, and Whitey... Made a noble try for the ball, diving after it, but he was unable to uh, get the ball and get it in time to make a play for anyone. It seems interesting to me, Red, at the present time, that we've gone through an inning here with the Yankees making five runs, and so far there is no uh, semblance of their patent at home run. It's been almost in one of these big innings of the Yankees. It seems as though somebody walks up there and hits one out of the park. Isn't that your impression of the Yankee big inning? Right you are, Warren. And uh, there's also some big stuff brewing down there, which uh, doesn't very often happen. Now, uh, that uh, mistake about announcing Gumbert as the relief pitcher is causing a furor, and I guess you know the technicalities involved. I suppose you go ahead and explain it, Warren. Well, after he becomes announced uh, officially as the pitcher, he is definitely the pitcher until at least he throws one ball. And when uh, Kaufman appeared on the mound, Art Fletcher, the Yankee coach, immediately went over and started complaining to the umpires about it. And the result was it was quite a conference. Now we have Gumbert back there. Gumbert, number 10, now pitching for the Giants. So that's the way that thing works out. I think that's the first time in World Series history that I've seen anything like that. Frequently in baseball games, we've seen uh, a pinch hitter announced and go up to the plate. For example, a left-handed hitter going up to hit and a pitching substitution is made. 
Whereupon another announcement is made of a right-hand hitter, and the right-hand hitter takes his place at the bat without the left-hand hitter having been up there at all. But as far back as I can remember, this is the first time we've had a pitcher in the game without doing any more than warming up in the bullpen and walking all that long distance. And it certainly is a long distance from that uh, giant bullpen in right field. So that now that law and order has been restored again, we really do have uh, Harry Gumbert out there pitching, and I congratulate you, Red, on uh, detecting that, even though Coughlin got in ahead of him. Well, thanks a great deal, Warren. And uh, I guess baseball is like life itself. You can never tell just exactly what's going to happen. First, uh, Gumbert is announced, and then a correction. And apparently that's all there is to it, uh, so most of the folks up here think that Coughlin's coming in to pitch. And then suddenly uh, a technicality is involved. And it involved, was involved, around whether the public address announcer was officially informed that Gumbert would pitch. And evidently he was, because that being the case, Gumbert has to pitch. Had the uh, announcer himself, just on his own authority, said Gumbert would pitch, that wouldn't have had any bearing. And now, up there now, is Lazare. But the throw goes over to first base as Gumbert officially goes to work. Harry Gumbert, the former Baltimore Oriole, throws again to first base. Here's the situation here in the last of the sixth. With one man out, Selkirk is at first, and Hogg is at third. The Yankees are riding out in front, 5 to 1. Up there at the plate on a crouch is the very stick. Gumbert delivers inside for ball one. And now, technically, Gumbert is in the ball game. He's delivered one pitch to Tony Lazari. around toward left. The Yankees lead off first and third. A curve floating down in there for ball strike one. Sorry, looking at it takes it. Tony hit back to Hubble in the second inning and was probably tossed out at first and then Hub struck him out in the fifth. That was when Hub wound up his great sequence of 14 straight Yankee victims. And that was the last of that string. The Yankees put on a string of their own here in the last of the sixth. There's a slow ball hit through the second base on the right center field. And in from third comes Hogue. Around the third goes Selkirk. A change of pace was met with a half swing by Tony Lazari, who was trying to hit behind the runner, and he singled through the middle, right underneath Burgess Whitehead, who was running up on it. And in comes another run, and the Yankees are now plus five, leading six to one. And Gomez, who was placed up in the last of the sixth, is now coming up for his second trip. In the last of this inning, the 10th Yankee to bat, and just one man is out. A single right back through the middle by Lazari, which lets in still another Yankee run. And Gumbert, who had to come out and pitch to one man, now is taken out, and Coughlin comes in. Coughlin, number 14, now pitching for the Giants. And now at long last, as the fellow once said, Kaufman is in the ball game. Dick Kaufman comes into the ball game, and as he comes in, the Yankees are ahead six to one. Gumbert pitched to one final. It was Harry who singled and knocked in the Yankees' sixth run. Up now is Gomez, who was first up in the last of the sixth, then drew a walk. The fateful pass. Gomez hitting left-handed, Dick Kaufman, tall, rugged, right-handed. Off first is Azari, off third, Selkirk. Gomez says Kaufman's taking a little too much time, so he stepped back out of the box. On to, of course, Paul's time. The outfield a little toward left. Swinging, strike one. Kaufman came down with a slant, just above the knees on the inside. Gomez chokes that bat just about an inch. Pumps it back and forth. Shot infield, pulled right up on the base pass. Low inside the ball one, right across the shins. One and one. Fletcher, jumping up and down, back of third. He's very, very elated. Looks as though he's filled with the elixir of life. The pitch is low. And it's ball two. Two and one. Six to one in favor of the Yankees. Six runs in the last of the sixth. 
Apparently, that isn't all. Gomez in the crouch. Takes low, and it's ball three. Three and one. Hoffman. Punishing a big two of the backer. Just the point of his jaw out there. Very belligerently. Now walks around back of the mound. Kicks a little dirt. Pulls the peak of his cap down snugly over his eyes. Splits into the black loam topsoil. The Yankee Stadium. Looks toward first. Foot third. Now delivers. Three one. Low for ball four. Twice Gomez has walked here in the last of the sixth inning. And this reloads the bases. Still just one out. Gomez, twice up here in the last of the sixth. Is both times given an Annie Oakley to first base. This pushes. Lazari down to second. And Selkirk down to third. Selkirk already at third. Bases full. One out. The batter is Frank Fazetti, who singled sharply once in this six already, up for a second time. Takes it way outside. Ball one. A little shortstopper from the Yankees. Choking that war club. Standing right off the plate. Easily balanced. Space is just as full as a tenement house in the busy district. Hoffman right hands it down, and it's swung on and ball tipped back. One and one. Gomez at first. Lazari at second. Selkirk at third. Mancusel goes out to talk to Kaufman. Infield lazily passing the ball around between themselves. This has been a severe jolt to the Giants. This last of the sixth inning. And the Yankees... Are still the Yankees, running absolutely according to form on the dope sheet. No variations at all. Hoffman comes down, Grisetti swings, it's a fly ball into short left field. Up comes Joe Moore on the dead run. Under it, make the catch, and the runners are forced to hold where they are. The throw in is cut off two thirds of the way toward the plate by third baseman Malai. That's out number two here in the last of the sixth inning. Red Rob. Hitting left handed steps up. Two men gone here in the last of the six. Base is full. Copper drying off the fingers of his right hand. Bob pulls that black cap. Down snug around his ears. Pump that stick back and forth. Half feet a little toward right. Pitch it outside, a change of pace. Ball one. Drop. Ball set. Easily balanced. Gets one for three this afternoon. Takes low inside. Ball two. It was Kaufman's fastball. The sights were not quite high enough. This vast throng, many, many thousands, here at Yankee Stadium. Wildly hilarious. And even a foul ball through the first five and a half innings has sort of settled back. Either completely filled to a point of satiation with happiness or else completely crushed. No inside for ball three. And with the bases loaded, Kaufman is behind two red rock. He hasn't hit his target once. Misses once more, walks in a run. There's a strike. Just stone the knees on the inside. 3 1. Crouch stepping back out of the box, steps in again. And Juso down on his crouch, calls for it. Runner don't lead down very far. Now they start speaking off. Gomez isn't cutting up down at first. He's conserving his energies. The pitch. Outside for ball four. And a walk to Ralph with the bases full. And in comes another Yankee run. Ralph is started with batting in. That run. 7-2-1 in favor of the Yankees. Six runs to the good. 
throw it on that play. Larry, moving down the third and Gomez to second. Up now is Joe DiMaggio. Swings. It's a high fly ball deep out into center field. Lieber goes back and pulls it down. Well, that's all for the first six innings. And it looks like it might be all for the afternoon. However, a ball game is never over until the last man is out. But first, before anything else is said for Warren Brown, we pause for station identification. Back at the Yankee Stadium, and this ball game coming to you through the National Broadcasting Company and its associated station has certainly provided a big inning, finally, after we remained around here for upwards of five and a half innings watching quite a pitching duel between Lefty Gomez and Kyle Hubble. The Yankees certainly caught up with Hubble in that last inning when they secured six runs and seven hits. Not all of them, of course, all for Hubble, for he was gone, and during the balance of the inning, we had two giant pitchers in there. Harry Gumbert, who seemed to come in because of a mistake in identity on his way from the bullpen, and Dick Kaufman, who finished up for the game. There were a few bases on balls crowded into that inning, and certainly one break, which went against uh, Hubble at the time he was in there. However, full credit must go to the Yankees for the ability with which they leaped to the attack once they had an opening, and it was the first opening in the game that Hubble had given them. All right, Red. Lefty Gomez is ready now to start the seventh, pitching to Jimmy Ripple. He does strike one call. Sharp breaking curve just above the knees. Ripple has one for two this afternoon. He started off what looked to be the Giants' beginning of the fifth with a single. Takes low outside and it's one and one. Gomez has never lost a World Series ball game. And it looks as though he'll still be able to camp on that record for another few hours. Seven to one, favor of the Yankees. Ripple swinging, foul tips it back. Right two, one and two. First giant up from the seventh. Yankees ahead seven to one. After Ripple, McCarthy, then Mancuso. Infield straight away. Up a step on the left side. Full depth on the right. Outfield a couple of steps toward right on Jimmy. Full hitter. Swings. There's a fly ball going out into left. Hold coming up fast. Takes it on the run. It's all for Ripple. One up, one going to seven. That is McCarthy. He has one for two. He singled through Lazari in the fifth inning to send Ripple around the third base. Jimmy later coming in on Mancuso's double play ball. The only run the Giants have. McCarthy, a rookie, takes strike one call. This has been his rookie year in the big leagues. And at the end of his first year in the majors, here he is in the World Series, and he has one for two at the moment, up for his third time. Swings and misses at a curve, strike two. Missed that one off the end of his bat. They're playing McCarthy, just as they did Ripple as far as the outfield is concerned, toward right, left side of the infield the same, and Lazari is a step or so more down toward first. High inside, on the chest for ball one. One and two. McCarthy, very slender. Big Bill Dickey sets his mitt. The ball is bounced easily back to the mound. Gomez traps it, throws over to first. That's all for young John. Getting back to the box. Two up, two gone. Up at the seventh. Hitter is Gus Mancuso. Comes back out of the box. Takes the meat end of his stick. Knocks the dirt out from his spikes. Now stepping in. Close over against the catcher. Fences straight away. Strike one call. A little hook was snapped in just above the knees on the inside. Right hand hitter. Gomez. Elongated, slender left hander. Delivers. Fastball inside. One and one. Gomez draws up his knees almost under his chin. Flails those arms around his back limb. Ties himself up into such a knot you wonder how in the world he ever gets out of it. Delivers. Inside. Ball two. Two and one. Lefty pitching just as he has all the afternoon. Taking the sign. Then going right to work. Takes time out for a blow right now. Looks into the dirt as though he were reading a letter from home. Straightens up. Blows again. And this time, it's Mancuso who backs away. He says, well, got the blows on me this time. Just steps in. 
Double swinging stretch. Gomez delivers. Mancuso hits it high out into short center field. DiMaggio comes running under it and takes it. And it's nothing across for the Giants in the top of the seven. And more observations from Warren. any ball club down for the time being. Naturally, with Gomez being as effective as he has been throughout his American League season and throughout this ball game, with the exception of the fifth inning, it was uh, hardly likely that the Giants were going to cut loose and have any big inning off of him any more than it was that the Yankees were going to have one off of Carl Hubble. But that, to me, is one of the reasons why there are probably more than 60,000 people here looking at this baseball game. One never knows what is going to happen in a ball game. At the very minute that Hubble walked Gomez, who was a pitcher, no one suspected that he was due for the trouble that happened. And so, Red, looks like they're ready to start again, maybe on Kaufman this time. Dick Kaufman, ready to pitch to Lou Gehrig. And does so, call strike one, buzzing it down just above the knees on the outside. Gehrig has all for two official trips. The only time he got all was in the sixth with a deliberate walk. Later came around to be scored. Out to very deep, ground toward right. Columbia Lou, tremendous favorite here, sets. Gets back from one inside up against him, tight for ball one. One and one. Dick Kaufman, the third of the giant pitches. In the ball game and in the sixth inning. Now working, starting the last of the seventh. Gary swinging, it's a sky-high foul up on top of the stands and back of third base. Hits up at the edge of the upper facade and drops all the way back. Like a bum. Oh, that's one bum. The people weren't dodging. They were fighting to get close to it. Hoffman comes down with a change of pace. Just missing outside. Out levels it two and two. Gary certainly had to lay the engineering eye on that one. Dick delivers. Missing inside, it's 3-2. Eric turned a little bit toward right field. Digs in solidly, standing on those piano legs of his. Takes outside for ball four. And Gehrig has walked first up in the last of the seventh. That's walk number three. Given up by Kaufman. Walk number six given to the Yankees. Nobody out. Last to the seven. Gehrig now leading down off first. Bill Dickey, who has one hit out of three tries. Stands waiting. Batting left-handed. Very, very tall and slender for a catcher. Outfield toward right. Dickey pulls. Infield pull up around second. Bill takes a curve outside. Ball one. Off and missing. Seven, two, one. In favor of the Yankees. Nobody out last to the seventh. The man on first. Low for ball two. Kaufman's having trouble with his control. There's no new experience for Kaufman to be pitching against the Yankees. As most of his major league career has been in the American League. Washington to the Browns. Being released by the St. Louis Browns, came over to the National League with the Giants. Pitches inside. There's a throw down to first, not in time, by Mancuso. And it's 3 nothing. 3 nothing to Bill Dickey. Gary going first with a pass. Dickey set. Kaufman misses inside with his 3 nothing pitch for ball four. And Dickey trots off to first base. And Gary moves down to second. Of the six Yankees that Kaufman has pitched to, he's walked four of them. Big Amble's back onto the mound. Bill Terry standing out in front of the giant dugout. Looks down into the dirt for the moment. 
Imagine Bill doesn't feel like joining a choir and singing one of his now famous solos. Batter up is Merrill Hogue, who drops a punt down toward third and it rolls foul. Strike one. Nobody out. Last to the seven. Seven to one, favor the Yankees. Gehring on second, Dickie on first. Result of passes by second relief pitcher Dick Hoffman. Much attention is focused on the relief pitchers in the last of the sixth inning. And there was a slip-up on the general ship somewhere. Gumpert was announced, and he was sitting in on the dugout. Hadn't thrown a ball, hadn't even been in the bullpen. He had to hurriedly go out and pitch to one Yankee, even though Kaufman was announced following him. Kaufman couldn't come in until Gumpert pitched to one man. Now hold the right-hand hitter, takes high outside. A throw down to second, isn't in time, and Bartell... On the third base side of second base, leading for the ball, has Husky Lou Gehrig come right into him, much as an end tries to take out an opposing tackle. Gehrig fighting to get back to the bag, and little Bartell in his way. Well, you can guess the result. Gehrig got back to the bag. One and one. Hope down in his crouch. He has 0 for 3. Doesn't choke the bat. Tries to butt, and this one is popped foul back of third. So far, the Yankees this afternoon have been unable to lay down bunts when ordered and and then have been hitting with two strikes on them, base hits. It seems to be a pretty good baseball strategy. It's working today anyhow. Working at a thousand. Now can Ho continue the Yankee policy? One and two. Money away. The runners lead off first and second. Huffman twirls as though he would throw back to second, but he doesn't. Gary taking a long lead. There's a ground ball hit to third. Hot scoops it up to the second one away. The relay on the first. It's a double play. Gary pulling down to third base. And Hogue was unable to continue that Yankee policy so far on the sixth inning. Trying to punt, fouling off two pitches, then hitting safe. He fouled off his two punt pitches, then hit into a double play. Hot to Whitehead to McCarthy. Gary on the double play, moving down the third. It's two outs. Last to seven. But now it's Selkirk. Turns sharp and toward right. Swing, fouled it. Sends around. Strike one. George has one for three. His singles came in the sixth. Law but one of the Yankee hits came. There was a sharp one wrapped through the hole between first and second out in the right field. Outside, ball one. One and one. Two out. Gehring on third, 90 feet away. The Yankees lead seven to one. Outfield pulled around toward right. Shucker takes a change of pace low. Two and one. Ormsby working balls and strikes. Ball behind first, Basil behind second, Stewart behind third. Huffman comes in, it's an outside pitch which is rolled down to short. Bartell picks it up, throws over to first, in time. McCarthy leaning in, makes the stretch and the pickup. That's all for the Yankees. And at the end of seven innings, it is 7 2 1. Warren. Well, Red, that was interesting to watch how Kaufman righted himself after that bad start out there. Since he got into this ball game, as you pointed out, he certainly was very wild. And after he walked the first two men in the inning, that seemed to me to be the opportunity for the Yankees to start a lot more trouble there. But uh, the play that Ott made to turn that uh, drive-by Hogue into a double play helped Kaufman out considerably. And I suppose that the Yankees are content with what they have now, and I don't know as I blame them. Seven runs at this uh, part of the ball game going into the first half of the eighth inning seem to be a lot of runs, considering the way that Gomez has been going since he started this ball game. Well, here's the first giant hitter coming up, Red, so back to you. Greg, just Whitehead will start it off. As you go into the beginning of the eighth, at the end of seventh full inning, for the Yankees, seven runs, seven hits, and no errors, while for the Giants, one run, five hits, and one error. Burgess Whitehead, who has so far the only extra base hit, takes strike one, call, right down in first pitch of the eighth inning. He doubles. Last time up, he has one for two. 
Swinging. It's a fly ball out into center field. The Maggio waiting lazily under it and has it. That's all for Burgess. One up, one away in the eighth. And Wally Berger is coming out to bat for Coughlin. Big Wally Berger, former big fam of the Boston Club of the National League. Well, there's not going to be any slip up on who's going to pinch hit. Umpire Orsby and the public address announce a meet, and they tell each other exactly what's coming off. Number three, five, four, five. The first pitch to Berger is high outside, ball one. Wally is the big strapping six-footer, hitting right-handed. Gomez delivers. Berger swings. It's a high fly ball, long out of the center. DiMaggio waiting, waiting, takes it. So off for Berger. Two up, two away. Top of the eighth. Jojo Moore, the thin man of the Giants, or the Gauls Ghost, as he's sometimes called. Last steps up to hit for his fourth time. It means the Giants are starting their fourth batting around. Joe Single through the middle in the sixth. He has one for three. Hitting left-handed, then deep in the box. Takes strike one, Call sharp curve down above the knee. Moore is steered as one of the most dangerous first ball hitters in baseball. He hasn't swung on a first pitch this afternoon. Takes low inside, ball one. One and one. Joe pumping that stick. Low outside. Moore's ahead. No man behind. Gomez comes in there. Low for ball three. Three and one. Swinging, it's a high foul. Back of third. Cross goes over, but he cannot get it. He's back into the box. Still 3 2. Two out, nobody on. John has the eighth inning, which is the first of the eighth. The series is being opened at the Yankee Stadium, the American League Ballpark this year. The Yankees, the home club. 7 to 1. The argument. Uh, power supremacy. 7 1, play for the Yankees. Four swings on another three to fit. This was a fly ball into short left field, and it drops safely in there for a base hit. Four turns to the left at first, then holds on. Dropping a fly ball single in short left field, about 15 feet inside the foul line. That's the second straight hit for Moore. He's the first giant to have more than one blow. Hit number six off Gomez, and it's the first hit off Gomez since five hit double. Two out in the fifth. Two out. Four leading off first. The batter is Dick Bartell. There's one for three. Swings on the first pitch. It's a long line drive deep into left. And it's caught. Right back up against the stands by left fielder. Hold. Ball for the top of the eighth. The Yankees are still a plus six run. One. effective pitcher that he has been right down the line. That base hit that Joe Moore dropped over there in the left field wasn't such a severe one that, should have, that it would have startled anybody. And at all events, it came when there were two out, which is a good time normally for base hits to come, especially when there are no one on base. Since his uh, little mishap in the fifth inning, Gomez has gone right straight through this ball game and he's pitched I wouldn't say remarkable baseball, but he's just the kind of baseball that people have been expecting from because of the fact that Wally Berger was used as a pitch hitter in the game. We will have a chance this afternoon to look at uh, four of the giant pitchers. And, Red, because we can never be sure who the uh, giant pitchers are after that uh, practice that was established in the sixth inning, suppose you take a look at him out there and decide whether or not he's Smith. He looks like Smith to me. Do you think he is Smith? Well, if he's not Smith, uh, Warren, he's certainly wearing Al's uniform and looks just like him. Al Smith, the out of a little left-handed curveball artist. And he's fourth giant pitcher. 
thrown against the Yankees here in the first game, 1937 World Series. Smith has just taken his place there on the mound, simply throwing down to Gus Mancuso. In the season of 36, Smith was just about tops for the giant reliever. One time, Bill Terry said that he just about the best relief pitcher that he ever saw, especially coming in there with a curveball. However, this year, Al has not been tremendously effective. And the relief burden among the Giants has had to be uh, shifted around from man to man. However, it's a well-known fact that when the Giants want some real relief pitching, Hubble has usually been the fellow who went out there and made one run stand up. First Yankee up in the last of the eighth inning is Tony Lazari. Lots of people are now beginning to leave. We're going to the last of the eighth inning. Lazari hitting right-handed. Swings on an inside pitch. Missing for strike one. A steady stream of people trying to beat the mob, which will be pouring out of Yankee Stadium. Six more out. Now leaving already. Lazari takes low inside. One and one. Al Smith coming on to the last of the eighth. And it's the New York Yankees. Seven runs the New York Giants. One. Seven to one. Smith comes down. High. Two. Two and one. Al's very stocky. Throws a uh, sort of side off. Doesn't wind up. Now field is toward the left on this alley. Tony takes up against him for ball three. Three one. Smith taking the return from Mancuso back slowly back to the mound. Now comes down. It's in there. Swung on and hit deep and far back into left. And it's a home run for Lazari. go after it and get fat on it. The first home run of the 1937 World Series. Hit high, far, into the lower spectators deep behind left field. And well up among them. No question about that. And now it's 8-1. to one. Gomez is up. Swings and misses. Strike one. About the one thing left to make Gomez's cup of joy overflow is to get a base hit. He, like any other pitcher, dearly loves him. Gets back from one up against him. One and one. Lazari. Really pickled one for keeps. Just a moment ago. Smith comes down with a curve in there. Ball strike two. That one drove Gomez. Left hand hit a banker step and then broke away from him and down over cleanly. One ball, two strikes. Nobody out. Gomez falls away from a pitch. Pulls it deep into right field. And ripple. This judge against then goes back to make a spectacular catch. Gomez, set to hit that pitch, fell into it and got his whole weight behind it and drove it deep out into right. Ripple came in, misjudged it at first, then saw the ball was going to carry a ball over his head, started running back. One foot slipped underneath him, but still he managed to get strength from somewhere and leap high into the air to make a spectacular one-handed catch and save himself. Frank Rossetti hit the first pitch of line drive right to Pellon. And that's two away in the last of the eighth inning. Warren's going to tell you more about Ripple's catch. I can see him sort of licking his chops in preparation for that. Line drive hit Frank Rossetti to Pellon for the second out. Now it's two away, last of the eighth inning. Nobody on it, Red Roth up. He has one, four, three official tries. Hitting left handed, he tries to butt and foul tips it. Strike one. Left hand batter, left hand pitcher, Al Smith. The fourth giant hurler in this ball game since the sixth inning. Eight to one. Favor of the Yankees. I feel straight away. Drop doesn't go after it, but it's good. Ball strike two. Smith burnt that one through his fastball. Put it deep out and right. Off down his crouch. Leads back from one inside. Or one. One and two. 
Drop up there, hitting. DiMaggio, leaning down his right knee on deck. Drop cocks that stick back in his left ear. Swings. It's a high fly ball out of the left field. Joe Moore goes back one step. Now comes in one and has it. That's all for the last of the eight. Warren? Fred, I noticed that you suggested that I was going to talk something about that catch that uh, Ripple made in this inning. First, I want to say that this inning stirred memories in me rather than uh, excited me about what happened here. When Tony Lazeri got his home run this afternoon, the first one of the 1937 World Series, I was thinking about one that he made last year, which came with three men on bases. That was truly a sensational one, since that doesn't happen very often in World Series history. When Ripple started after that ball out there, believe it or not, Red... I was thinking of a catch he made in Chicago not long ago with three men on bases at a time when some of us thought that the pennant lay between the Giants and the Cubs. And if he hadn't made that catch with those three men on bases, why, maybe there would have been a little different in here. I think that's the way everybody accepted it, so that when Ripple went up in the air and caught Gomez's long drive, much as I hated to see Gomez lose and his life's ambition to make a base hit, I couldn't help think of that catch in Chicago. So now back to you, Mallott takes the first pitch of the ninth inning. Ball strike one. Gomez looking just as strong and fresh as when he started. Comes right back in. Ott swings and misses. Fastman burnt down around the knees. Strike two. Gomez gives his crowd a little yank. Straightens up. Knees and elbows akimbo. He comes out of it. Strike three swinging. And on three pitches, Master Melvin is struck out to start the ninth inning. That's the second strikeout for Gomez. He got his first strikeout at the expense of Hank Lever. With a third out in the first inning. And here is Hank up again. Hank has 0 for 3. The Yankees had 8 to 1. One out, nobody on top of the ninth. John Fatty. Lever takes. Go outside. Ball one. Gomez still shining brightly underneath that record of his of having never been beaten in World Series competition. Inside, and it's ball two. Two nothing. Now, Phil is very deep on Hank. He gets a hold of it. He'll give it a ride. Pitch. Right in. That one is taken. Two and one. A steady stream of people going out of every possible exit here at Yankee Stadium. They figured some time ago the outcome of the game was decided. Lever swings. It's a fly ball out of the center. Maggio coming in makes the catch on his chest. Two away, top of the ninth. Up steps Jimmy Ripple, who found Major League Baseball was much more lucrative and pleasant than being an ambidextrous paper hanger. Up field toward right. Triple hitting left handed, takes inside against him, all one. Jimmy looking very calm and cool. To say that he is a left handed hitter is only half the truth. The pitch, call strike one. When Ripple came to the Giants, he hit from either side of the plate. Terry insisted that he hit as a left-handed swinger. Low, outside, one and two. He counts slightly in his favor. Two out, top of the ninth. Nobody on. The Yankees, seven runs to the good, leading eight to one. Two balls and one strike. Gomez delivers. Low outside, and it's three and one. Ripple looking very coolly. It's one for three this afternoon. Single, first up in the fifth inning. Ball four. Walk, going down to first base. And that's the first base on ball given up by Lefty Gomez this afternoon. Seven of the Yankees received gratuities. Ripple on first, two out. Batter is young Jack McCarthy. Or John, if you don't know him very closely. Swings and misses. Strike one. That one right down in there. McCarthy, slender, young first baseman. He's finishing his first year in the majors by participation in the World Series. Swings, foul tips that one back for strike two. Gomez has promptly gone ahead of him with his first two pitches. Nothing in two to McCarthy. Dickie down in his crouch. 
First baseman Gehrig back in his fielding post. Flipper's allowed to lead his ball off first he wants to. High outside. Ball one. One and two to McCarthy. Gomez at the moment seems to be just slightly tired. He gives you the impression that he is trying to put a little bit more on the ball than he has any other time. Pitch is high. Two and two. Two, two. Two out. Top of the ninth. Carthy waiting. Ricky calls to the pitch. Carthy swinging. Foul tips it right back onto the screen. Count still hangs at two and two. He'll pull toward right. Things are quiet right now. About the only hubbub from the spectators are those who are moving, trying to get out of the park. Pitch misses outside by a hair for ball three. And it's three and two to Jack McCarthy. And now the running hit is on for Ripple at first base. He'll be breaking Gomez's arm. He does. Pitches in. Rolls slowly down toward first. Gary comes in the field. He picks it up. And tags McCarthy out as Jack comes running into first base. Gehrig with a big grin on his face. Stuffs that baseball in his hip pocket. Grabs Gomez by the hand. The two of them shake hands and are the first players off the field as they dash into the Yankee dugout and disappear from sight. And the Yankees win, would you say convincingly? Well, I don't know of a better word. And to speak a convincing truth, it's got a great deal of pleasure for this old uh, redhead to be able to talk to you the last four innings. And now this is Red Barber handing you over to the very capable hands of Warren Brown who is going to put you just right on how everything happened this afternoon and plenty out of debt. Warren. Well, thank you, Red. And summing up this ball game, the first of the 1937 World Series, it was, after all, strictly a matter of pitchers. It started out that way between Lefty Gomez, the best pitcher, I suppose, in the American League, and Carl Hubble, who was certainly the superior left-hander in the National League. Right up until the sixth inning, it was a ball game between these two. And if anything, Hubble seemed to be the more effective of the two. In the fifth inning, the uh, New York Giants had crowded Gomez sufficiently to score one run, which looked like a lot of runs. In that inning, manager Joe McCarty of the Yankees, who has steered them to a couple of pennants in a row and one world championship, had to make up his mind whether he wanted to pull his infield back and play for a double play and stake the Yankees to, or the Giants, I should say, to one run and take his chance on what would follow. That's what he did. Pull his infield back, and Gus Mancuso hit into a double play. Out of that, the Yankees were able to escape with only having the one run scored against them, which came in on the double play. And that was the one big inning, or the start of one big inning, that the Giants were able to have off Gomez all afternoon. On the other side of the field... Hubble, after uh, walking one man and allowing a hit in the first inning, was uh, unhittable right on through to the sixth inning. Then he did a thing which baseball folk always think, uh, since there is a lot of superstition in baseball, they always think that if you walk the first man, and especially if you walk the pitcher, there's going to be trouble. I don't think that any of the more than 60,000 people in this Yankee Stadium this afternoon suspected that when Lefty Gomez got his base on balls to open the sixth inning, that there was going to be quite as much trouble as there was until the last man was retired. Before the last man was retired in that inning, the Yankees had driven Hubble out of the box, and because of a mistake in announcement, Harry Gumbert was in there in time to pitch to one man who got a base hit off him, and Dick Kaufman finally got the inning over. Before he did, there were seven runs scored and six hits. And that was the ball game. Later on in the game, in the eighth inning, with a fourth giant pitcher in action, Al Smith, Tony Lazari, batted out the only home run and, incidentally, the only Yankee extra base hit of the ball game. That made the score eight for the Yankees, at which they rested on their laurels in this first game. In looking over my scorebook here, I find that the Yankees have eight runs and eight hits, which seems to me to be a very effective way of doing business. Going into the game tomorrow, which will also be played at the Yankee Stadium, the second game of the series, I don't imagine either manager will change from his plans. Before the game today, Bill Terry told me that he intended to come in with Cliff Melton, and I imagine he will come in with him, Melton being the young left-hander 
who has won his 20 games in his first full year up here in the major leagues. Joe McCarty of the Yankees said that he intended to pitch red roughing tomorrow, and Joe was inclined to go a little further. When he talked to me, Joe was an old friend of mine, and he spoke his mind out to me down there in the Yankee dugout before the game. He said that he didn't think that he would go away from a platform that he established uh, rather effectively last year. He said that it would be Gomez today, roughing tomorrow, and after that, Monty Pearson and Bump Hadley. And unless the Giants pull themselves together and tear after Melton, I imagine that's the way the Yankees will go through with the same four pitchers that they used in the World Series last year. The uh, game t today was certainly an interesting one. There was a lot of spectacular fielding on both sides. And while there wasn't the tremendous burst of hitting that we've been led to expect from these two clubs, and particularly from the Yankees, who have capitalized on their power to win an American League pennant off by themselves, nevertheless... They did mass together and put across one big inning. All right, George Hicks, I'll say goodbye now, and it's yours. Well, all I can say is that the game is over and that historical first marker is down. The tips are down and the Yanks are up. And the crowd is now pouring out. By the time the game was well underway by the second inning, practically every seat in the Yankee Stadium was filled. There must have been close to... Uh, the 60,000 mark and over. The new additions, you know, seats 71,000 at Yankee Stadium now. And so we've had the first game right now as we look down from our tier, the third tier right at the edge over home plate. The diamond itself and the green outfield is simply uh, dotted and spotted all over, and the exits crowded with these thousands of spectators who are taking home their memories of the first game of the 1937 World Series. Uh, as I looked at it, uh, very much of a spectator this afternoon, the walk of Gomez in the sixth and that slashing single to center by DiMaggio with the bases loaded for the first runs, well, I think that broke Hubble's heart and the giant spirit for the game today. And uh, by the way, the only homer today was Lazares, the first man up in the eighth. He pulled a terrifically long and high homer into the left field grandstand. Must have gone at least 400 feet uh, no, nobody on, but that was the homer of the day. And uh, so I guess that's about all we can say. This has been brought to you by the NBC and its associated stations from coast to coast. We'll be back on the air tomorrow, of course, with the second game from the same position at Yankee Stadium. As you know, the first two games are played at the stadium, and then the third, fourth, and if there is a fifth, at the Polo Grounds and the sixth and seventh at the Yankee Stadium if necessary. We'll be back on the air tomorrow at our regular time, 1.15 Eastern Standard Time. That's 12.15 Central, 11.15 Mountain, 10.15 Pacific Standard Time. Your announcers will be Tom Manning of Cleveland, Red Barber of Cincinnati, and Warren Brown, sports editor of the Chicago Herald Examiner. And so, well, that's all. Till tomorrow, George Hicks announcing this program is brought to you through the National Broadcasting Company. We wish to thank the American Home Products Corporation, makers of Old English Wax, Louis Philippe Leap Stick, and Colonel's Toothpaste, Sterling Products Incorporated, makers of Philips Facial Cream, McKesson and Robbins, makers of Kalox Tooth Powder, and the Procter and Gamble Company, makers of Camay, Oxidol, Crisco, and Ivory Soap, for their courtesy in relinquishing the time for their programs usually heard over some of these stations in order that the National Broadcasting Company might bring you a description of the World Series baseball game.